Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to have Juan Pablo talk first, and then Professor Chomsky, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, I'd like to tell you about Juan Pablo Ordonez. Uh, he is a Colombian human rights lawyer. He has focused specifically on the human rights uh, related to social cleansing killings and on gay and lesbian rights. In 1991, as the chief of investigation for the judicial police, he investigated 40 cases of social cleansing killings, and he found that in all 40 cases, there was a direct link to uh, a direct role for the, in the national police. Um, because of his investigations, he received death threats and finally had to leave Colombia. He, um, he, he returned, sorry, for his work, uh, especially, especially with human rights of uh, sexual minorities, he received a prize in 1994 uh, called the Felipa de Souza Award given by the International Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission. Uh, Juan Pablo worked here on, on the still you know, telling people about social cleansing, killing, and, and about uh, working for gay rights and lesbian rights. But he returned in 1994 because he wanted to do more research on these social cleansing killings and human rights uh, and the human rights is, is sexual orientation. His report on sexual orientation is the first such study in, in Colombia. He, his report, which he spent last year writing, cannot be released until he's safely out of Colombia. Then he, he will release it, and he, he knows from previous experience he cannot stay in the country after the kind of work that he's, he's uh, unveiling, the kind of role that the police has in social cleansing. Um, I'd like to welcome him up here to talk to us. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, actually, what I'm going to talk about is the report. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is it, and we're already in the process, so we hope I'll be back in about a month, and so we can start publishing. The report is divided in three parts. The first part talks about the general situation of human rights in Colombia. The second part talk, talks about social cleansing, and the third part talks about human rights and sexual orientation in Colombia. About the first part, one of the things that maybe some of you know, and for those who doesn't know, Colombia is formally, and especially with the new constitution that started in 1991 on July 1st, is a democratic pluralist country. It's one of the most democratic countries, formally talking, in terms of the new constitution. But never reality has been so far away from the formality. We are really far away from being a democracy. The abstention goes over 70%. Anybody or any group that tries to be in opposition is killed. Any voice is stopped, even getting people in jail or killing them. There was a new, another, uh, the only opposition that we have in the last very few years was Union Patriotica, a party that, that brought up some hope of having a different to the two traditional parties, the liberal and the conservative, which both of them are very, are very conservative. And this group, the Union Patriotica, was killed member by member that was elected in any small town as mayor or council member. More than 3,000 members of this Union Patriotica has been killed. The new administration, Ernesto Samper Pisano, the new president, took place in 19, last year, in August 7, and things hasn't changed at all. Despite the renegotiations with the guerrilla members, the peace talks, despite the best, the, the, he has made this effort to make a better relations with NGOs working with human rights. And also he has, for the first time in our history, the president has agreed to admit that there is a real terrible human rights situation. So despite all these three efforts that could be accredited to the new president, what we have seen is that this is anything else but a make up from the government to try to show to the public in general that we are a democracy and we couldn't be far away from that. The truth is that because the international pressure and the NGOs work within Colombia, they have made all these steps. But in the last few months, the situation hasn't get any better. The situation is even getting worse and worse. Between January 1993 and September 1994, every day close to five persons were killed for violence, for political violence, every single day. Every two days, three persons got killed in the war between the armed forces, 
and the, and the guerrilla members. Every two days, one person is tortured in Colombia. The poverty, the, the poverty is so that 50% of the population lives in poverty, which is 18 million persons. 12 million live in the absolutely poverty. Between January 1993 and September 1994, close to 70% of all the political crimes were committed by the armed forces, paramilitary groups, or the dead squads groups. Oh, the national police is part of the armed forces in Colombia. About 30% was committed by the guerrillas members. If we see the political killings in just in this, uh, from 1991 to 1995, we get the number of 5,000, I mean 9,412 political killings, which is almost as many as the whole 1980s, which was very well known as very violent in Colombia in terms of political killings. We can be absolutely sure to, when we say that in the same proportion, it is a policy of the Colombian government to, this, to do systematic violations of human rights. It is also in the part of the guerrillas groups, which many of the times, most of the times, are nothing else but a whole bunch of criminals trying to hide themselves with the supposedly good for the people, but they nothing else that want to work for their own interest. In 1990, there was a case that is well known now, Caso, his, his name is called Caso Trujillo, where over 100 people were massacred in the, in the Department of El Valle, only because of the pressure of the International Commission on Human Rights, Inter-American Inter Commission on Human Rights, and a deal they make with the government, they set up this new commission to investigate the cases committed in 1990, and they found out that there was a Colonel Uruena uh, who was compl implicated in these murders. They torture and they massacre every single of the persons before uh, they torture them before they kill them. And it's very well known that he did this in conjunction with drug traffickers, which shows us that definitely uh, there is narco paramilitarism in Colombia and narco militarism in Colombia. There is no question that uh, there is a narco guerrilla too, which is members of the guerrilla groups that helps or assist narco traffickers. And there is narco militarism and narco congresses, and there is uh, for sure, it's what somebody called last year uh, that Colombia was a narco-democracy. Uh, I was asking the media, what do I think about calling the country narco-democracy? I said, well, they've been very good with us because we're very far from being a democracy, so I call Colombia a narco-pseudo-democracy. In 1994, in January, there was a massacre committed by the guerrilla members, the fifth front of the FARC, which committed 35 uh, killings in a massacre in a in a neighborhood called La Chinita in Apartado, in the region of Uraba in Colombia. And many NGOs uh, got together and did an investigation and found out that the guerrilla groups were uh, responsible for this massacre. Many, many cases, the, the civilians are caught in the middle of this war. Many, many cases are accused by the other group to be a supporter. They, they are accused to be supporter of the other group and therefore they be killed. So sometimes they are forced to give water to the armed forces or give water to the guerrilla groups, and the very few next days, the other group would come and would kill them for supporting the other side. Despite the media obsession on the drugs problems, uh, the, the real truth is that less than 1% of the killings in Colombia, uh, uh, political killings in Colombia, have anything to do with drug dealers. 70% are committed by armed forces, and less than 1% is committed by drug dealers. In Colombia, Colombia is one of the most violent countries in the world, with an average of 28,000 persons getting killed every single year. The rate is about 70 people per 100,000 population, compared with Brazil, which is the next country, with about close to 25 people per 100,000 population, and compared with the United States, with eight people per 100,000 population. As we all know, one of the things that uh, the media talks all the time about is the, uh, is the, drug, uh, the drug war, 
and uh, even the U.S. Embassy in Bogota has pushed this sort of uh, court system called public order courts, which is the same known as non-faced judges that are, uh, where they were supposed to bring to justice the big drug dealers. And the truth about it is that all of the drug dealers that are, have been in jail is because they surrender themselves in exchange for very low sentences in a very luxurious places. And these courts have been used more often and often to persecute uh, union leaders and community leaders in general who have no way to defend themselves because a lot of the evidence is a secret evidence. And this course, as I said, was, was pushed by the U.S. Embassy in Bogota. And then we, then we have to ask ourselves if a kilo of cocaine cost in Colombia $2,000 and it will cost in the streets of the United States $60,000, what happened with the rest of the money? Uh, it seems to be like the process of bribing and the transportation and so forth and so on. We give, we put the, the, the kilo of cocaine in 20, thousand uh, dollars a kilo, which means that the drug dealers are making about 15,000, 5,000 goes in expenses, uh, 15 is going in earns for the, for, the, for the cartels in Colombia, and the big question is what happened with the other 40,000, and uh, so wh what are them? Who, is, who are them, and uh, where is that money coming from? Because a lot of the money is definitely not in the hands of the people in Colombia. Uh, the second part of the report talks about social cleansing. And uh, to talk about social cleansing, it started in 1980s in Colombia in a little town called Pereira, where uh, it was just groups of policemen's officers killing street criminals. But things have changed, and it used to be only a big city problem, not any longer. Now in a very rural areas, we've seen social cleansing, such as the case of Puerto Lopez Meta, where we've seen an average of one killing a week in these social cleansing operations. The name that they brand the people uh, is Disposables. It's a name set up by the national police uh, when they start doing this social cleansing. It's, it's a way they get, that's how they get away to uh, get some, some sort of legitimacy because they are killing Disposables. Uh, in this report, I talk about specific cases with that, that we have a struggle with. Uh, one of the cases is in a town called Santa Marta, where it, just, it happens very often. A group of uh, homeless people were moved from Santa Marta to different cities. From the government agencies were moving the people. And when uh, some media person went to ask the person in charge of human rights, you know, do you think this is uh, human rights abuses committed? She said, no, there is not, because they even gave them some soda and some sandwiches for the trip. One of the, who are the victims of this social cleansing, of this genocide, neo-Nazi uh, type of behaviors? One of them is the street kids called gamines. Uh, gamines are street kids between 40, that start from 40 years old. Most of them, they have to leave their house because of domestic violence. 38% of the people that has been killed in the war between the armed forces and guerrillas are 14 years old or younger. 30% of, of the Colombian population is 18 years old or younger. 800,000 kids, uh, uh, 17 or younger, work on the streets. In 1993, there was a, a case of a girl nine years old who went to a police station to bring some food to, 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 her, to her father. She was raped and killed into the police station. Nobody's in jail for that crime. Uh, it brought a lot of attention from the international community, and it, uh, after that, it came a reform of the national police, and new laws came to reform the national police, and they put the commissioner. The truth is that the commissioner hasn't uh, have any strength to do anything. So again, they just did all this makeup, uh, like they always do in Colombia, and they haven't done any real change in terms of the human rights situation. They spent millions and millions of dollars with, to showing the image of democracy all around the world. Uh, but we all know that the things don't get any better. The another group, oh, about the, the kids from the street, 82% of the social cleansing they, uh, are, are victims are street kids in Colombia. Uh, other of the groups, and there is a group that nobody wants to talk about, and even NGOs have overlooked the problem, and they don't want to deal with them because they don't want to be related with, are street criminals. Uh, drug addicts and people who sell drugs in the corner. As I say, even NGOs have really been 
are overlooking to the problem because they don't want to be related with them. The, the way that their first enemy is the, pol the national police, their second enemy, they call the commas, it's security guards, private security guards paid by business, by owners of different business that wants to get rid of them, uh, of them uh, and they even get paid to clean, whatever that means for them. One of the things that we have found is that they see two types of polices. One that are the honest and one that they call the not honest ones. They're very friendly with the not honest ones because they're the ones that take bribes for them. We, we have heard of cases of the policemen coming to the house very early in the morning and asking them that at the end of the day they will have to get 20 or 30 or 50,000 pesos. And they will have to do it in any way they have to but they, they will have to pay that in the end of the day to the police that ask them for the money. Uh, one of the other things they have to pay is special taxes, this is the, the way they call it, to just survive. Every single month they will have to go to the police station and pay them that. Sometimes we've seen people uh, that is being caught when they are committing a crime, and the police brings them to the station they chase them, they take the money they stole from the, from, from, the, from the person they stole, and they come to the customer and say, oh, sorry, we didn't find anything. Uh, and then this other group, it's called the group of the, not the honest policemen, which they're really scared about because they're the ones who do the social cleansing. They take them, in Bogota, they take them to a, a mountain called Choachi, and what is called the Choachi Run. They take the people there, and they, uh, they even execute them there, or they make them run down the hill, most of them get killed trying to escape, and of course if they get killed, they have no choice, it goes to the, to the files just as an accident. In some cases, when there is shots to the, to the body, they would not allow to do any investigation to the, uh, to the judicial system, and I, and I know this for a fact because I got experience when I was working uh, in the judicial system, they wouldn't allow us to get to the body. And if we like, were really strong that we wanted to get to the body, they would take a few minutes just to cut their fingers so we couldn't uh, do uh, fingerprints and get any identification. Of course, these people never go to a dentist, so there was no way to get identification by the, by the dentist plaque. And uh, in these cases, if there is no a positive identification, there was not a murder. The, about the street criminals, 35% between 1993 and 1994, 35 percent of the social cleansing victims were street criminals. The other group that we heard about uh, is the beggars, people that uh, I call just beg in the streets. And we know, we also heard about many, many cases. One is that is very well known for m many people, even uh, some of you may have heard. In 1991, in the school medicine, in Barranquilla, uh, they found bodies that were used by the school students uh, of these people that were coming to, 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 to do, I mean, by the students that were using these bodies as part of their, of their training. Uh, I went to Barranquilla to find out what was the, the whole case because the media only talked about 14 cases and it wasn't really clear about the whole picture. What I could find, uh, first, that were over 50 bodies, second, that Everything started because in the budget of this school, they have this, this part of the budget to buy bodies. And they, have no, they, they don't follow up the regulations for buying the bodies for the medical school. They just have the part of the budget that is very easy to cash to buy the body. They would pay an average of $150 per body, and the police would bring the bodies. So the police brought the bodies, and the university, the person in charge, would give them the $150. They have this... Um, security guards they, uh, for the university, and these people saw that the police were making money out of it, so they decided to get into the business. And they started calling street people and asked them, you know, why don't you come here and clean something, and they would kill him and beat him up inside the school and sell the bodies to the medical school. And yet the students were doing their practice with these bodies. Uh, what is more horrifying is that, of course, the university knew, knew about it. There was a budget item for it, and Many people, uh, they do agree that almost none of these medical schools in Barranquilla do follow up the regulations, so we don't know if this is some kind of practice that, is keep, that keeps going on. And the director of that university is uh, a former senator in Colombia. We also knew about this, this case that uh, I got to get very, known very, from very close, about a, a beggar that used to live in this little cartoon car 
he used to get together with a woman and a 12 years old uh, guy just in the night to, to accompany each other. And uh, the police were harassing them and asking them to leave, to leave the place, but they had no any place else to go. So one night, about 1 a.m., two police motorcycles came, put gasoline on them, and turned them on fire. The kid died, the woman, after a year and a half, still in the hospital, and he can't uh, do any work or walk or anything. The other group is the female and male prostitutes. Uh, one of the biggest problems about female prostitutes, uh, again, the first enemy they call is definitely the police, the police uh, for raping, for uh, detentions, arbitrary detentions, rapings, beating them up, and, and killings. And they always, uh, the first enemy is, is the police. About the female prostitutes, I do talk about the history and so forth and so on that I'm not going to get into it now. But one of the things that strikes me is that 50% of the 18 years old and younger female and male prostitutes, they affirm that they have never received any information about AIDS. The other group is the transvestites and male prostitutes, aged between 10 and 18. There is no study about this uh, group at all. And it's easy to know, to, to understand that in such a homophobic society where just people don't care what happened with faggots. And we have seen cases and cases of whole groups of 15, 12, 15, 20 groups of male prostitutes that have been killed in, in one or two months term and no investigation have ever launched. With this group, especially with the transvestites, they have another victim. Not only the uh, death squads that attack in general them and the police groups and everything, but also a skinhead neo-Nazi type that has been growing in Colombia since 1993, and they are extending their power in many different cities. The identity of the transvestites, most of them identify themselves as a women and also as being the only homosexuals, saying that any other homosexual that do not dress as a woman, they just don't have the courage to do it but they're not homosexuals. In the stats, and any stats that talks about social cleansing, everybody, they just have an item, homosexuals in general. When you go a little deeper in the, into the stats, you find out that uh, for, for the homosexual item over, it's only people that when they went to pick up the body were men dressing as a woman. So we don't really have any real number about how many people is being killed for being homosexual, we just know have a certain kind of number about how many transvestites that at the time they were dressing as so were killed for being homosexual. Why is it that there is group, there is uh, group so-called disposables? There are two main reasons. One is economical and social problems. As I say, 12 million is absolutely poor. 18 million is in poverty. 75 percent of the Colombians do not drink pure water. 20.8% of the kids eight years and younger present very severe disnutrition. Only 33% of the Colombians finish high school. Only 8.77% finish, uh, finish uh, university. The second reason, and of course all this brings a lot of violence, domestic violence, a lot of people in the streets. The second reason for the existence of this group is the internal displacement. There is in Colombia 600,000 people uh, displaced internally because of the war between the guerrillas and the paramilitaries and the, and the armed forces. There are two types of displacement, one which is transitory and one which is permanent. The transitory is when there is brigades, military brigades, that come to the town, bomb the town, and just stay there for a while, and then leave. The people would leave their own homes. Of course, when they are in their houses, they check into every single house to try to find any subversive stuff. So the people would leave, and they will, they will come back. When they will come back, then all the intelligence work that the militaries did will be given to paramilitary groups who would start killing and persecuting the people that they found as like enemy, which is any leader. Why is it just such a thing as social cleansing? There are, and 
which is one of the most saddest part of the whole program, that, the whole project, is to find out that definitely there is sort of legitimacy in part of the society. Most of the society approved this social cleansing. Most of the society agrees with it. I mean, you ask in the streets, you ask to uh, housewife, you ask to teachers, you ask to a lot of lawyers, especially. And most of the cases, they would say, yes, they should just get rid of them. They should just kill them. You know, you can't walk in the street because then somebody's going to uh, get your stuff. It's a try, it's a way to kill an identity. It's a way to kill anybody who is dangerous or who is potentially dangerous for whoever is doing the killing. The, whoever is doing the killing do believe they are heroes. They are doing something good for the society. As we, uh, this insecurity is, is so terrible that just in Bogota in 1993, uh, a lot of, more people were killed than in the whole Iraq-United States war. In, in, and as I say, the violence that talks about 70, 70, 70 persons to be killed per every 100,000 population. The second reason is impunity. Only 20 cases, only 20 crimes have never, never got into the system out of 100. So we have 20 cases that are never denounced into, out of 100 into the system. Out of these 20, 12 of them, I mean 14 of them, uh, expires. So we have only six left. Out of these six left, only three goes to punishment, which means that Colombia has 97% of impunity in terms of the crimes that are committed. With this 93, 97%, that means that you have only 3% of possibilities or ever, or ever been punished for any crime you committed. Of course, out of these 3%, most of the people that are punished are the most vulnerable, are the same people that are lucky not to get killed in social cleansing and belong to this part of so-called disposable groups. Of course, there is, it's very unlikely to get any police officer or, armed or military person to be punished for any of the crimes they commit. We have uh, martial courts, uh, which means that we have cases, we have seen cases of people, commanders, who order uh, a massacre, and then later on they're going to be the judge of the persons they, they ordered that massacre. Uh, of course, so there is an absolutely impunity. And the police also are treated with these kind of uh, martial military courts. No, no, even if they were supposed to be only for crimes committed for military crimes, the truth is that for any type of crimes that they commit, they will be uh, judged by the, by the military courts. There is other reasons, such as economical reasons, uh, which means that sometimes the people that have their own business, they don't want, uh, they, they want more clients, more customers to come, and if these people is there, no customer will come, so they pay for people to clean the streets. Uh, one thing very sad that I found is that in some cases, owners of gay bars pay for this social cleansing to get rid of transvestites. And also, there is homophobic reasons and moral reasons why to do that. What do they look for? Why some people want to do that? Of course, they want to punish because there is no punishment from the authorities. I would always say that the main human rights abuse in Colombia is impunity. Just every do whatever they please. And it's not only the main, but it's also the reason why so many other human rights violations comes after that. They do to prevent people to repeat those behaves that are not like, that people don't like, the society don't like for them to, to do. So in order to prevent that more people will do the same behaviors, that's another reason why they do kill. They do sometimes just to get away from some neighborhood uh, these kind of people, and I think they do also just to get rid of what brings in a lot of guiltiness for having so much and the other one having nothing. Human rights and sexual orientation in Colombia. One of the things that I found, uh, we have many people coming from Europe and the United States trying to organize the gay and lesbian community in Colombia. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And the wrong, wrong, wrong is because we have to start realizing that even the concept, the definition itself of being gay and lesbian, it's different. We have some behaviors that are absolutely different. For instance, uh, in the north part of Colombia, it is absolutely acceptable, it's even uh, 
stimulated by deaf families and the society for the kids between 10 and 18 years old to have sex with donkeys and chickens. And this is, they have even the, the, the belief that the penis of the kid will grow faster and better if they have sex with donkeys. Uh, and I know it's like, uh, wow. But it's a cultural thing that happens, especially in the north part of Colombia. And uh, so, it's, and we have then, in this same part of Colombia, a group called Cacorros. Cacorro is the men who have sex with another man who is the top. Uh, it's really more kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't call them homosexuals because they do not have any feelings for the other men. It's more kind of masturbation, really. Somebody have called them homogenitals. I wouldn't even call them that. It's just a, a type, it's more kind of a power thing of getting over the other person and masturbating with another person. It is absolutely acceptable for the society in youngsters. Of course, when you're 18 and you're still being a cacorro, then people is going to see you like weird. So if you can imagine a society, and this is going to be hard for some of you, a society where it's not only approved, but it's stimulated to have sex with donkeys, but to make love with somebody with the same sex is absolutely inadmissible. Uh, in the same part of the country, we have seen many files that say, you know, I would rather to have my daughter who is a horse than my, gay, my son to be a gay. I would rather my son to be killed before being, uh, being gay. And yet, they do stimulate these kind of behaviors, like having sex with animals or showing their power with another man. Uh, of course, lesbians, the first problem with lesbians, and I do not like to talk too much about lesbians because I'm not the person that should be doing it, that should be a, a lesbian doing it. But with their excuse, I would say that the first problem they have is the absolutely, completely invisibility. They just do not exist. And talking to some lesbian, they say, well, it's something that sometimes is good because we can't walk with another woman and kiss in the street, and nobody's going to even realize they're lesbians. The last 10 years, Colombia didn't have any uh, gay and lesbian group, organization. We just found the Colombian Lesbian and Homosexual Association that is working especially with human rights and we're really concerned on the most uh, vulnerable of all, which are the very poor. And in this, more than in anything, uh, the biggest problem of the Colombian uh, gay and lesbians is the internalized homophobia and the classism and sexism. We've seen cases of lesbians that claim that they've been sexual harassed in gay bars. We have cases of a lot of gays that get into a power and because they want to hide or to stop being public their sex orientation, they would take actions against the gay and lesbian community. And actually I'm out in uh, a Supreme Court judge who did it a while ago. We have cases of Absolutely, actually, and I was there absolutely out. I was the only second person that is absolutely in the media out as a gay person. And I have to say that the, most of the attacks that I had, homo, it came from the homosexual community. It came from gay and lesbian who didn't want um, to have their, any chance to be exposure to their sex orientation. They didn't want anybody to talk in public about the sex orientation. They were just too scared, uh, which is hard to understand, but I think I could understand why when you have your own homophobia, it is more difficult to overcome that, that for somebody who is straight and find out that it's not true what they've been telling you since you're little. And, and again here, I, at the same with everything human rights in Colombia, we have a beautiful constitution. Article 6 of the constitution talk about equal protection under the law, and even says that special protection for minorities. Uh, the Article 16 talks about the right to develop your own personality, which is like wonderful. It couldn't be better in terms of the constitutional rights. The Supreme Court in 1994, in March 1994, in a wonderful and beautiful decision, decided that uh, you cannot discriminate against gays and lesbians in the military, and which is a lot better than, than the Noah, don't ask, don't tell that you got here. But again, the truth is different. When you, they find you're gay, they're just going to make your life miserable. They're not going to fire you because they can't, but they're going to make your life miserable. And we've seen cases of people just being killed, and then they just go by the, to the public as suicide. We've seen, 
we just presented cases in Pereira about a woman who wanted to visit, to have a conjugal visit in jail with her lover. It's on the courts right now. We are hoping that we're going to get done. Uh, the day before I left Colombia, we presented this other for domestic partnership because the laws in domestic partnership from 1990, uh, they only talk about uh, men and women, which is very, uh, heterosexual relationships. So we present the court to the constitutional court. Uh, we present a case asking to say that those laws are unconstitutional because those are against the equal the right of equal protection under the law. And we have some cases in the courts of the, the decision about personal doses, uh, which came last year that allowed anybody to uh, have the personal doses of marijuana and cocaine without being illegal. Uh, it really is the most wonderful decision in terms of gay and lesbian rights because it talks a lot about the right to develop your own personality, about the freedom that you have as a, an individual, and that might be one of the reasons it's being so attacked by the Catholic Church. We have, we have talked to even persons from the government, and we talked with the person in charge of all the jails and prisons in Colombia about the case of these two women, why they weren't allowed to visit each other. And he said that uh, he just believed it's not right and it would bring a lot of unmoral to the jails. When I, asked, when I told him that it was unconstitutional to take that decision, he said, well, you might be right, but because my Catholics believes, I will not do it otherwise. Uh, this is the report. It's yours. That's it. <laughs> Hey, uh, by way of introducing Professor Chomsky, I just want to tell you a little bit of what it's like to do human rights work about Colombia living in the United States. Um, those of us who do this is because we were so shocked and so sad to find that in such a wonderful country like Colombia, if you've ever been lucky enough to go there, you know, it's full of wonderful people, wonderful things, these things are going on. We prefer that it wouldn't be true, but they are. And we felt that we had to do something. And as you know, there's still very little in the media about human rights in Colombia. You can read about drug dealers and this and that, but very few real uh, coverage of, of the human rights situation in its true political context. So um, for this reason, people like Professor Chomsky are really uh, wonderful to help us out because we want this whole complicated message to go out. What, there are social cleansing killings, but why are they going on? In what context? And uh, once again, I'd like to encourage you if, you, if you feel really moved by, by these stories, to, to join us with Colombia Vive. Um, Professor Chomsky has been putting uh, attention on Colombia. He has included Colombia in the books that he's been writing. He's included Colombia in the speeches that he's been giving. And today, he has, he has agreed to join us and, and tell you uh, about Colombia. And I want to thank him from the bottom of my heart for helping us out. There are basically uh, two facts about Colombia that I think we should bear in mind. The rest is all footnotes. Uh, the first fact uh, is what you've just been hearing. Uh, it has a horrendous human rights record. Uh, right now it uh, wins first prize in the hemisphere, uh, which is not an easy prize to win. Uh, the uh, political killings, as you heard, are somewhere variously estimated at five to 10 a day, uh, uh, mostly state security forces. Uh, the second fact is that Colombia receives uh, more than half of uh, US military aid for the hemisphere, uh, that uh, when Bill Clinton came in, he was gonna change that, and he did. He increased it by about 12%. Uh, when the Pentagon budget was not ample to uh, deal with the increase, uh, he turned to uh, emergency uh, overdrawing uh, uh, facilities available to the president, pretty much as in the case of the recent uh, bailout of uh, uh, investors in Mexico. Uh, the uh, 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 crimes uh, in Colombia have been pretty awful through the 80s. They've been increasing. They got worse 
under the most recent president, uh, Cesar Gaviria. He was a special friend of the United States, in particular Bill Clinton, who liked him so much that he rammed him through as Secretary General of the OAS under a, with a power play that was pretty much resented in the hemisphere. Uh, the State Department, uh, uh, in affirming their support for President G uh, Gaviria, uh, said, praised him particularly for his steps towards uh, uh, extending democracy in Colombia under very difficult conditions, uh, that the conditions are difficult is not in doubt. Uh, I think you can ask the several thousand murdered people of the one opposition party, though, were they around, would be glad to tell you about it. Uh, and President Gaviria helped uh, substantially in uh, creating and expanding these conditions, so the support for him made a lot of sense. Uh, now, there's absolutely nothing new or, uh, or out of the general pattern uh, in this correlation between the most horrendous human rights record and the, mat and the uh, largest uh, U.S. contribution, in this case, literally more than half the military aid for the hemisphere. In fact, that's a standard correlation. It's been shown over and over. Uh, there was an important study of it by the leading academic specialist on uh, human rights in Latin America, a very mainstream scholar, Lars Schultz, University of North Carolina, uh, did a study in an academic journal it was published in 1980 uh, in which he simply compared U.S. foreign aid in Latin America with torture in Latin America uh, and found that they were remarkably well correlated uh, as he put it, uh, U.S. aid flows primarily to the most, uh, to the worst human right, to countries that torture their citizens, to the most egregious violators of human rights in the hemisphere. Uh, this continued right through the Carter years, no change. Uh, it included military aid, and as he was careful to point out, it was uncorrelated with need. It was not that the countries that torture happened to be the most needy. In fact, there was no correlation at all. Well, that might lead a superficial observer to conclude that the United States just likes torture, but you're all scientists and you know that you can't deduce causality from a correlation. Uh, and in fact, uh, another study was done at the same time that sheds further light on it. This was done by an economist at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, a long time colleague and co-author and friend of mine, Edward Herman, and we published it in a joint book about the same time. Uh, Herman did a broader global study of the correlation between human rights, and, uh, between torture and uh, foreign aid. And certainly the reason why torture is picked is because Amnesty International does an extensive survey of torture. They are an important organization, but they have a very specific mandate that they keep to. Uh, and one of the things is torture, so there's a pretty good record of torture. And he found that uh, across the world, the same correlation held. Uh, there's a very close correlation between uh, torture and uh, USAID. In fact, he concluded quite realistically that uh, Washington is the torture capital of the world, if you trace back torture to its source. Uh, I don't think any statement we published in that book has aroused so much uh, fury, but I'm afraid it's true. Uh, the uh, correlation was global, but Herman also did a second study which shed some light on it. He compared U.S. aid with the uh, climate for business operations in a country as measured by ability to re repatriate profits and so on. And he found that uh, foreign aid was very closely correlated to uh, the climate for business operations, the investment climate. Now that correlation makes sense. Uh, the purpose of foreign aid, after all, is for the U.S. taxpayer to pay off U.S. corporations via some other country. Uh, and therefore, the, which is what foreign aid, in fact, amounts to overwhelmingly, uh, and uh, like most social policy, uh, and, uh, in, and the fact that uh, foreign aid increases as the climate for business operations increases, of course, is completely natural, in fact, almost automatic, as people would know if there was such a subject as 
international relations or political science or government where you study the things that go on in the world. Uh, in fact, it's almost a truism. Uh, now, why should there be a correlation between uh, U.S. aid and torture? Well, that's a secondary correlation. There happens to be a very good reason why uh, improving the climate for business operations is associated with torture. Uh, one of the best ways of improving the climate for business operations is to murder union leaders, uh, uh, torture uh, priests and nuns who are trying to organize peasants, uh, kill human rights activists, and so on. That has a marvelous way of improving the climate for business operations. It's one of the main things that contributes to what are called economic miracles in another department down the street. Uh, and uh, so naturally, you have a correlate, so that's a reasonable correlation too. And if you put those two reasonable correlations together, you just happen to find by accident a secondary correlation between U.S. aid and torture. So the proper conclusion is not that uh, U.S. leaders kind of enjoy torture, it's that it's a matter of total indifference. Uh, what they care about is profits for U.S. investors, and it just happens that that's correlated with torture, uh, a global phenomenon and a perfectly understandable one. Uh, actually, it's broader than that in the case of Colombia, uh, illustrates it, uh, it's an important feature of maintaining a favorable climate for business operations. An important feature of it is uh, creating a society that has formal democracy with ample oppression. Uh, and to maintain formal democracy with oppression does require plenty of torture and killing and uh, social cleansing and other things. Uh, and to maintain a, an economic system of uh, extraordinary injustice of the kind you just heard described, uh, where, let's, where half the children are hungry, for example, and so on, uh, that, uh, that requires uh, harsh measures, and that's what security forces are for. Well, uh, all of this is completely familiar to anybody who looks around the world. Uh, in the case of Colombia, it was explained quite clearly some time ago by the president of the Colombian uh, Permanent Committee on Human Rights, Alfredo uh, Vasquez Carrizosa. Uh, he pointed out, I'll just quote his description, he said that Colombia has been, a, has a wonderful, is a wonderful democracy, not only since 1991, but you know, I think 1886 or something like that, whenever the first constitution was really nice, almost as nice a democracy as uh, the Soviet Union under Stalin, which also had quite a beautiful constitution. Uh, the, uh, uh, he says that uh, the, uh, behind the facade of a constitutional regime, we have a military, militarized society which has been under a state of siege virtually constantly. Uh, there is, for example, land reform legislation, big, plenty of land. And, and so I should say Colombia is quite a rich society. It's not that it's a poor, impoverished society. It has enormous wealth mineral wealth, oil resources, agricultural resources, uh, even had the beginnings of industrial development. And in fact, it's not impossible that it might have had an industrial revolution if it hadn't been under the leadership of uh, business classes who were more or less committed to free market policies. And one of the sort of small secrets about economic development, very well established over several centuries, is that free market pop, pop, pro, uh, policies are a recipe for total disaster. Uh, part of the reason why the first world is first world and the third world is third world, although they were more or less alike back in the 18th century, is that the first world, without exception, the United States is the most extreme example, but it's true of everyone else, followed extreme protectionist policies and still does. Uh, whereas what we call the third world pretty much followed free market policies because it was rammed down their throats. Uh, and the difference is notable, uh, and whatever possibilities there were for an industrial revolution in Colombia, which were not slight, given its resources and its population and everything else, they were essentially aborted by the uh, fact that they follow the rules, the rules that they teach you about in the IMF and the World Bank and so on. Uh, the, uh, and it's not the only case. In fact, it's remarkably uniform. Also well known to economic historians, I should say. Uh, the, uh, 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 so Colombia is a rich country, but a very poor one for most of the population. Uh, it had, uh, land is a big problem. 
uh, not that there's a shortage of it, but it's owned by you know, a very tiny number of people. Uh, and there is land reform legislation. It's been on the books since 1961. Uh, but it simply isn't implemented. The reason it isn't implemented is the country is run by uh, the landowners and the uh, army who work for them, uh, and who are paid by you and me. We, that's where our taxpayer money goes to. Uh, that is well known as well. Uh, in fact, it, uh, uh, this present system was pretty well established by the Kennedy administration, which among its innumerable crimes, which were quite remarkable, and that's something that might interest us around here since it was a Cambridge-based administration, right from the elite universities, Harvard and MIT, uh, and following all the right rules that people design and invent and teach here. Uh, the uh, Kennedy administration uh, in 1962 uh, 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 instituted a change in hemispheric policy, which is one of the most important things that ever happened in the entire history of the hemisphere and would be well known uh, if we were to study things like history and so on. Uh, in 1962, the Kennedy administration shifted the policy of the Latin American military, and of course we're in a position to do that, uh, the, uh, they changed the mission of the Latin American military from hemispheric defense, as it was called, to internal security. Well, hemispheric defense was kind of a holdover from the Second World War when, you know, you had to worry about the Germans and stuff. Uh, but inter and it didn't mean anything. The only threat to anyone in the hemisphere was in Washington, and that's not what they were being paid to defend themselves from. Uh, the, uh, 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 but internal security isn't a joke. Internal security is just a code word that means war against the population. Uh, and that shift from hemispheric defense to internal security, which was implemented in planning, in uh, training officers, in uh, equipment, and so on, that led to a very substantial change. In fact, it set off a horrifying plague of repression throughout the hemisphere, uh, worse than anything in its quite bloody history. Uh, and that's well known, too. So, for example, some years later, the man who was in charge of, the, of counterinsurgency uh, for the Kennedy and the early Johnson administrations, Charles Maechling, uh, he described what happened pretty clearly and accurately. He said the, this change in 1962, this change in the Latin American military, uh, uh, made a change from U.S. toleration of the rapacity and cruelty of the Latin American military to direct U.S. government complicity in the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads. Uh, that's pretty accurate. And in fact, the reference to Himmler's extermination squads is also accurate. Uh, there's quite a good study done by one of the re main researchers of Amnesty International, Michael McClintock, two-volume study, uh, who actually did a, a, a study called Instruments of Statecraft. It's the third of a three-volume study. Uh, in which he simply looked into the background of U.S. counterinsurgency doctrine, the kind that was taught to the Colombian military, and indeed it goes straight back to the Nazis. Uh, after the Second World War, Wehrmacht generals and specialists were brought to the United States, and uh, they taught, showed how it was done, and the early Army training manu manuals, in fact, are mo not only modeled on, but mimic uh, Nazi uh, manuals during the Second World War in which they study how you control the enemy, the enemy being the partisans, uh, and the good guys being the Nazis, and so on. It's quite literally true. And it comes right on into the neo-Nazi states that were established throughout the hemisphere, uh, primarily by the Kennedy administration and its followers. So uh, Mechling's reference to the methods of Heinrich Himmler's extermination squads is not uh, simply a metaphor. Well, that was also understood well by the Kennedy intellectuals. Uh, for example, in internal communications now declassified between Robert McNamara, Kennedy's main Vietnam War advisor, and McGeorge Bundy, the national security uh, 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 advisor, who's former Harvard dean. Uh, uh, McNamara pointed out to Bundy that the military training 
that had been provided to Latin American officers, this was in 1965, so after a couple of years, the US military training provided the Latin American officers with the understanding of an orientation toward US objectives. And he says that was quite important because in the Latin American political culture, uh, the Latin American military must be prepared to remove government leaders from office whenever in the judgment of the military the conduct of these leaders is injurious to the welfare of the nation. Uh, he didn't bother saying which nation, uh, but since uh, they had been trained in the understanding of an orientation towards US objectives, I guess it really didn't matter which nation he had in mind. Uh, he was doubtless thinking specifically of the greatest achievement of the Kennedy administration in foreign policy, namely the military coup in Brazil, which had just taken place, uh, called the greatest victory for freedom uh, in the mid 20th century by Kennedy's uh, uh, ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, who then went on to become president of Johns Hopkins University. It's all in the family, you know. Uh, uh, this, uh, this greatest victory for freedom in the mid 20th century uh, was a military coup uh, which overthrew the parliamentary regime, which was getting out of line, uh, and instituted the first of the neo-Nazi national security states of Latin America, and Brazil is a big place, so it had a domino effect, and pretty soon it was spreading all over the place. Well, the generals there had an understanding of an orientation toward U.S. objectives, so pretty soon we had a wave of torture and murder and massacre and an economic miracle. Investors were doing very nicely, uh, foreign investors, uh, about maybe 5% of Brazilians were doing very, very nicely, in fact, living beyond anything that we can dream about, and most of the rest were kind of sinking into the state of Central Africa, but that's the definition of an economic miracle. If you look around the world, that's what it is, including Mexico, where we've just seen the most recent one. Uh, the uh, also called an economic miracle until December 19th, 1994. Uh, the, uh, uh, in Colombia, uh, this had its effects as well, continuing with Vasquez Carrizosa's remarks. Uh, in the 1960s, he points out, the violence in Colombia was exacerbated by external factors. The Kennedy administration turned the army into counterinsurgency brigades, accepting the new strategy of the death squads ushering in what is known in Latin America as the national security doctrine, the right to combat the internal enemy as set forth in the Brazilian doctrine, the Argentine doctrine, the Uruguayan doctrine, and the Colombian doctrine. It is the right to exterminate social workers, trade unionists, uh, uh, men and women who are not supportive of the establishment, uh, human rights activists, and so on by torture, assassination, mass murder, and disappearance, which the military learn uh, once they are given the understanding of an orientation towards U.S. objectives and follow the uh, uh, and uh, uh, follow the training that they pick up in the School of the Americas and use the arms that you and I pay for. Well. Uh, the official doctrine, I might as well read you the way the Colombian military sees it. The Colombian Mil Minister of Defense in 1989 described the official apparatus of terror. He says it's an apparatus designed for total war by state power in the political, economic, and social arenas, I'm quoting. Uh, now, officially, of course, the targets are the guerrilla organizations, but a high military official explained in 1987 that the guerrilla organizations were of minor importance, as you just heard. But this is now a military officer, not a human rights lawyer speaking. Uh, he said, the real danger is what the insurgents have called the political and psychological war, the war to control the popular elements and to manipulate the masses. The subversives hope to influence unions, universities, media, and so on. Every individual who were in one, in one or another manner supports the goals of the enemy must be cre considered a traitor and treated in that manner. Actually, those are quotes from a 1963 military manual uh, provided under the guidance of the Kennedy instructors uh, in the manner of the Nazis. Uh, so anyone in the uh, 
uh, economic, political, uh, uh, and uh, arena, anyone among the popular elements, anyone in the unions, universities, media, and so on, who in any manner supports what the military decides to be the goals of the guerrilla, guerrillas, they can be handled by the Argentine doctrine or the Uruguayan doctrine and so on. Uh, in this morning's New York Times, there's a story, uh, well, about 20 years too late, but it's nice to have it, about the Argentine doctrine uh, with a uh, military officer, a naval officer, who was involved in implementing the Argentine doctrine, describes uh, how his remorse over his participation in torture, uh, drugging, uh, throwing thousands of people, he, he, well, not, he didn't do all thousands of them, but he and his colleagues throwing thousands of people out of airplanes and so on, uh, that was the Argentine doctrine, all with U.S. support and uh, enthusiastic support. You might go back and look at some of the comments by Gene Kirkpatrick and others at the time, uh, which weren't quoted. The Times was rather polite about that. Uh, maybe in 20 years we'll learn something about the Colombian doctrine that's going on today. Uh, there was indeed a rare official window into that, namely the official um, report that Juan Pablo mentioned of the uh, Trujillo massacre, and that's kind of worth quoting, I think. It gives you a graphic account of what the Colombian doctrine is. That's our doctrine, remember. That's what we teach people, and we are trained to understand and support and pay. Uh, this was a 186 report uh, that was 186 page report that documented one atrocity, which by some miraculous accident got investigated. This is the massacre in Trujillo back in 1990 uh, under President Gaviria. Uh, the report was written by a, a commission uh, which was consisted of members of the government, Colombian government, the army, the police, and a number of human rights groups. Uh, the reason it happened was under foreign pressure, mainly OAS, uh, pressure, Organization of American States and other pressure, which led the Colombian government finally to agree to an official investigation uh, of, uh, they'd, and they concluded what everybody knew and what you can read about at great length in human rights reports, Amnesty International, America's Watch, they're constantly coming out, the never reported. Uh, if you're interested, I have a pretty detailed survey of them in a recent book, but they're quite easily available. And the official report simply reiterates what has long been known and long suppressed. Uh, they uh, point out that the uh, Colombian armed forces and national police uh, entered the region, the region where, broad, where the village is, uh, broadened their scope of action, stepped up their intelligence activities. Uh, they managed to get somebody under torture to concede that he'd been associated with the guerrillas, or to say it, you never know what anybody means when they say something under torture, for obvious reasons, uh, gave other names uh, for whatever reason. Then the report says the horror began. Uh, people were picked up around the village, detained. Uh, then just after 7 a.m., I'm now quoting the report, uh, Major Uruenya, he was the one in charge of the army and an associate arrived. First they had breakfast, then the major and several members of the armed group went into the shed where the people were kept and demanded identification cards. A list was drawn up, then they were taken blindfolded one by one, the first a 59-year-old woman to another part of the hacienda. A coffee sack was tied over the head of each victim and he was thrown onto the ground. Then Major Uruenya took a water hose, turned it full force on the face of each victim, the mouth and nose, and began to interrogate them. When he finished, the victims were piled one on top of the other, and someone called for the blowtorch and the chainsaw. Each victim was decapitated, cut into pieces with the chainsaw, and left to bleed. The heads and torsos uh, were put into different sacks, and later that night loaded into a blue 1956 Ford truck, got to get all the details straight, uh, drove, driven down to the river and dumped into the water. That's the quote from the official government report as to what actually happened. You can add your own imagination. Uh, this was 
the one of the participants who was too much for him after a while, and he uh, reported it to the Columbian, Columbian judicial authorities, an auxiliary to the major. Uh, this continued for weeks afterwards, right through the time when the headless body of the uh, parish priest was found. He was the 27th victim, and it went on and on. Uh, it, the testimony was given to a special, the Office of Special Investigations of the Prosecutor General's Office. Uh, it was then reported in detail by a study of the Peace and Justice Group. That's a church-based, I think, Jesuit, Jesuit-based, I think, group in Colombia, which does most of the hum a lot of the human rights publication. Of course, nobody paid attention to that. Uh, the person who released the information then went back to visit Trujillo, the town. He was disappeared by a group of armed men in the central square. And he hasn't been heard from since. Uh, the, since there had been publicity, there was uh, a trial, and the uh, army officers in charge, everyone in charge, was acquitted of all charges. That was 1992. Uh, but there was continuing international pressure leading to this uh, uh, meeting of the Inter-American uh, Commission of the Organization of American States, which led to the report that you have just heard, uh, which concludes that the Colombian army and police officers were directly responsible for the massacre and that members of the Colombian government and justice system were to blame for covering it up. That's the conclusion. Uh, they recommended that criminal investigations be initiated against uh, the major in charge, but the commission expressed its pessimism, as it put it, that national channels will ever be able to overcome the impunity, uh, and uh, it also records the strong opposition voiced by the commission's government members to the exploration of any kind of international legal mechanisms. Uh, nevertheless, they did recommend that a special prosecutor be formed, uh, the Church Peace and Justice Group, which repeats the report, can, presents the report, points out that there had been 350 other massacres since the Trujillo massacre, none of them investigated, uh, but they point out that this one is, is important for one reason, because it, it gives insight into the mor moral fiber of former Colombian President Cesar Gaviria, now the head of the Organization of American States, thanks to uh, liberal Democrats here. Uh, and uh, 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 it also gives insight into the values and principles of the Army, uh, but more interesting to us, I think, the values and principles of those who train uh, and arm and instruct the Army and the construct the doctrines in which not only the Colombian Army, but all the others uh, under their influence uh, operate. As for Colonel, uh, the President, to his credit, President Samper on January 31st did concede that the Colombian government was responsible for this. I think that's a historic first. I don't think anything was ever conceded. Colonel Urrenia was removed from active service. That's his punishment. Uh, the Army rallied around him. Uh, and, and dismissed uh, the Commission's findings and said that nothing further would happen. Uh, the Commission was presented, but to the Organization of American States on February the 7th, the report was, uh, with a, uh, uh, an agreement that in six months the government must uh, respond. And this Peace and Justice report ends by saying the country is waiting. Uh, how long it waits depends on whether anybody does anything about it here. If nobody does anything about it here, they'll wait forever uh, because nothing will happen, uh, just as nothing has happened in any other case. Well, uh, that's uh, the one case where the government itself described what had happened. Uh, the, uh, and uh, years later, the governments in Brazil and Argentina and uh, not Chile because the army is still on top there, but in other places uh, are conceding some of the things that happened under the doctrines that were uh, uh, instituted after this historic 1962 change. Uh, so it's good to know that our taxes are being well spent and recall that's more than half of U.S. military aid going up under Clinton, uh, where the, under the Latin American cultural environment, uh, the military are forced to act in this fashion. Uh, possibly someday there'll be some questions raised here about the North American cultural environment, 
uh, but we'll probably wait a long time for that, and if we don't do anything about it, we'll wait forever, and plenty of people will suffer. Well, U.S. advisors were involved in counterinsurgency in uh, Colombia since the early 1960s, uh, since the Kennedy period. Incidentally, the Kennedy period was bad enough, but it all reached its peak the, in the Reagan years. Uh, Reg the Reaganites were virtually just regarded Kennedy as their symbol. They virtually duplicated Kennedy's policies uh, internationally and even domestically to a large extent. Uh, and uh, the whole thing just shot out of sight. And that's, what, that's the reason why the studies that I mentioned about torture and aid were done in 1980. In the years that follows, nobody bothers. Uh, I mean, it's like proving that two and two is four. There's no point undertaking the study. Uh, the, uh, and as I, as I said, it's still going on. The worst human rights violator is also the greatest recipient of U.S. aid. Uh, well, uh, U.S. advisors were uh, involved in counterinsurgency. Uh, Colombia had the biggest training program for officers uh, in the 1980s when the situation was really getting horrendous. Uh, they had three times as many officers trained in the School of the Americas and so on as uh, El Salvador, which wasn't very pretty, as you remember. Uh, the uh, uh, they also um, have um, Israeli instructors, German instructors, and British instructors, not only the army, but also the narco traffickers, uh, where they are involved in the training of uh, assassins and paramilitary forces, according to the uh, Colombian uh, intelligence, the DAS. And the, according to Colombian intelligence reports, which have been released, uh, the, the uh, narco traffickers also have North American instructors, Amer that means U.S. instructors, uh, training assassins and paramilitary forces. That Colombian report has yet to be published here as far as I know, uh, and if it's been followed up, I haven't heard about it. I mean, published in the mainstream, you know, sort of out in the fringes, it's been reported. Well, the Without going into this uh, any further, uh, the uh, pretext for all of it is, you know, is the drug war. Uh, the drug war was launched, or more accurately relaunched, by George Bush in September 1989 with a lot of hoopla. Uh, in August 1989, a month before, the largest shipment of arms uh, ever was ever authorized under the uh, Foreign Assistance Act. The Foreign Assistance Act has emergency provisions, and the largest shipment of arms ever authorized was sent to the Colombian Army in August 1989. That's right before the drug war. In fact, that was more arms than all the arms sent through 1980, which was plenty. Uh, the arms were sent to the Army. They were helicopters, uh, planes, uh, you know, and so on. And as was pointed out at the time, and completely obvious at the time, those arms were totally useless for the drug war. About 90 to 95 percent of whatever was being done about the drug war was being done by the national police, uh, not with bombers and helicopters. Uh, but the bombers and the helicopters and so on were useful for something else. Uh, and you could see the effects right away in the reports, uh, bombing of villages, massacres, and so on, uh, things of the kind that uh, were the one kind that was reported. They increased uh, rapidly. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, their major effect probably was to strengthen the already existing strong links between the security forces and the narco traffickers. Security forces, the narco traffickers, and the landowners are about the same thing. I mean, it's hard to distinguish them, and that's well known. Uh, the, uh, 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 the Columbia gets arms from other countries too, or at least theoretically it does. Uh, the major source of uh, uh, infantry weapons, um, machine guns, and rocket launchers is Israel, but that's a fraud. That's just U.S. arms. Israel's one of the funnels by which the United States uh, sends arms to uh, its various murderous clients, uh, and Colombia is a case in point. Uh, also, Kfir aircraft and so on. Those are all U.S. taxpayer-funded armaments going to our clients. Uh, remember, the United States alone provides more than half of all, all, all its military aid in Latin America to Colombia when we add the indirect aid that the United States provides through its clients and the other members of the, U, uh, the, the enormous U.S. international terror network, including Britain, Germany, Taiwan, Israel, and so on, 
uh, the aid to Colombia is quite substantial. There's a lot of talk right now about the omnibus anti-terrorism bill, uh, but uh, you'll notice that uh, there's a kind of an odd omission, namely the center of international terrorism, uh, where the bill happens to be uh, uh, passed, uh, and that one isn't mentioned for some curious reason again. Well, the, uh, uh, apart from the role in uh, maintaining the system of oppression under democracy and a good climate for uh, U.S. investment, the arms going to Colombia have other needs. Uh, the person, the main ac academic monitor of uh, U.S. of arms sales overseas, William Hartung, just published a recent book in which he pointed out that the U.S. arms sales to the third world, including Colombia, satisfy an addiction uh, which is considerably greater than the addiction for drugs, namely the addiction for arms. Uh, the United States now uh, has about three quarters of the market, close to three quarters of the market for arms sales to the third world. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a very important fact because if you look at Pentagon documents or even White House documents, you'll see that there's a reason why we have to maintain the Pentagon at approximately Cold War levels. Uh, in fact, it's higher in real terms than under Nixon. Uh, the reason is that although superficially it seems that the threat disappeared, namely the Soviet Union, that's not really true. The threat is really the same as always, except now the threat is what is called, I'm quoting, the technological sophistication of third world powers. And to make sure that that threat is real enough so that we have to maintain a big Pentagon budget, we have to make sure that there's plenty of technological sophistication there so we have to send them advanced armaments, otherwise where are they going to get the technological sophistication that we'll have to protect ourselves from? Uh, furthermore, this is all, all completely explicit and frank. Uh, if you read, say, Lockheed propaganda, they say it. Uh, Jane's Defense Weekly, you know, the main international military journal, says it straight out and so does the Pentagon. So, for example, right now, if you want to know what your tax dollars are going for, uh, one of the things they're going for is paying the Lockheed Corporation, which happens to be headquartered in Cobb County, Georgia. Uh, it's paying the Lockheed Corporation to upgrade F-16 so they become more lethal. So then we can sell them to third world dictatorships. Uh, that's another gift from you because they're sold on loans from the Export-Import Bank, which is another loan gift from U.S. taxpayers to the Lockheed Corporation. Uh, and then that makes it necessary for the Lockheed Corporation to get more money to produce F-22 advanced fighters, which will defend us from the threat of the upgraded F-16s that we're sending them. Cobb County, incidentally, happens to be the uh, district represented by a gentleman named Newt Gingrich, uh, which happens to get more federal subsidies than any suburban county in the country uh, outside of Arlington, Virginia, which is part of Washington, that's where the Pentagon is, and the Kennedy home of the, the Florida home of the Kennedy Space Center, another component of the state sector designed by the Kennedy people to supplement the Pentagon ripoff of the taxpayer for the benefit of advanced industry. Uh, this all came to a head very neatly and symbolically a couple of days ago. I don't know if you noticed it, but buried in the discussions of the House uh, this, um, uh, debate over uh, school lunches was a harassing amendment that the Democrats put in sort of half seriously, only half seriously because they support this whole system as much as the Republicans. Uh, but in the debate over school lunches, uh, the question, you know, they're cutting $6 billion roughly from food for poor children. We still don't have half the children in the country starving like in Colombia, but they're trying really hard to get there. Uh, the, it takes some time because a much richer country will, will make it. Uh, the, uh, uh, so six billion dollars cutting off school lunches and the Democrats put in a half-hearted harassing amendment suggesting that that money be kept and be paid for by delaying, not stopping, but delaying the deployment of F-22s. Well, that one was shot down very unceremoniously uh, because welfare to Newt Gingrich's wealthy constituents has very high priority 
uh, and others like them. We all know about that at MIT, since we live off that same dole, pretty much. Uh, but the uh, main purpose of the Pentagon, very self-conscious since the late 40s, has been to maintain the system of high technology industry uh, via, through these methods. And uh, therefore, uh, we got to keep selling arms, since unfortunately, there doesn't mean any other thing we can do with them at the moment. Nobody much to drop them on right now. So now 75% of the arms market, that's an addiction and a real one. The economy very heavily depends on it. Uh, and uh, selling arms to Colombia uh, uh, helps that too. That's another factor that we can add to the uh, Herman insights about the correlation between military aid and torture. Well, I'm not going to review the human rights record. You heard something about it, but just let me end with a couple of comments on the drug war, the completely fraudulent pretext for all of this. Uh, it's worth thinking through, it has interesting aspects. Uh, Colombia became a big player in the drug war uh, in the late 1970s. That's when it started producing, becoming the main producer of cocaine. And why does all this happen? In fact, why do peasants in Latin America even bother producing coca, apart from their own use, which they've done forever? Well, there are reasons for that. Uh, they have to do with, again, what's uh, up on that blackboard. Uh, there are policies, social and economic policies, imposed on the third world. Uh, one of them is that they have to stop producing for their own needs. Uh, they have to start producing crops for agro-export. Uh, and they, they have to open their markets, which, just, which the Western countries have never done, of course. Uh, but uh, never in their history, certainly not us. Uh, we, but they have to open their markets to subsidized U.S. agricultural exports. We don't believe in the free market, remember, so ours are subsidized. Uh, subsidized U.S. agricultural exports will easily undermine domestic production. And since uh, the local farmers are being explained in the proper lessons of economics, uh, they have to uh, become rational producers which means produce uh, crops for agro-export, uh, and being rational, as indeed they are, they go for the crops that make the most money, and guess what that is. Uh, so in fact, uh, coca production has just shot out of sight, uh, and it's part of the basis for the economic miracles. So Jeffrey Sachs from Harvard, uh, who has recently been plying his trade with great success in Poland and Russia, uh, won his fame by setting things in order in Bolivia in 1985. Bolivia was in real trouble, but he moved in with proper free market theory, and pretty soon it was all fine. The macroeconomic statistics were really nice and so on. Various side effects. One of them was that uh, most of the exports, maybe two-thirds or something, were coca, uh, which happened to improve the economy and, of course, caused some other side effects. Uh, well, that's one reason, uh, and there are other things. So, for example, in 1988, the United States compelled the coffee producers to, uh, break, the, to um, break up the coffee agreement, which had kept prices at some reasonable level, and coffee prices fell 40 percent. That's Colombia's main export crop, uh, but also way down the region. And when coffee prices drop 40 percent, and you know, you've got half the children starving already, people are likely to turn to something that will make some money, uh, and there happens to be one thing around. So one uh, major source for the huge increase in the, uh, in the export of coca is, lies right in the free market policies that are imposed on the third world, but of course never accepted in the rich countries, not in their history and not today. Uh, a second reason, which is somewhat narrower, has to do with U.S. drug policies. Uh, U.S. drug policies have been designed to try to compel people to drop using soft drugs like marijuana and to turn to hard drugs like coke. That's actually the case. I don't say they thought of this and decided to do it, but that's what the policies are. In fact, it's almost a concomitant of the fact that marijuana is big and bulky and easy to detect and highly industrialized drugs are harder to detect. Uh, furthermore, there's another, if some of you want to do a research project, somebody around here wants to make sure they never get a job, but wants to study something interesting, <laughs> you might look into the history of why tobacco is legal, but marijuana is illegal. 
I mean, tobacco is vastly more lethal and destructive than marijuana. They're not even in the same domain, you know. Uh, but, uh, tobacco, in fact, is the most lethal substance around. Actually, the second most lethal, lethal substance known. The most lethal is sugar, I guess. But uh, tobacco is close second. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so why is tobacco Ill illegal but marijuana illegal? Well, I think there's a speculation that comes to mind. Uh, the speculation is that marijuana is kind of like solar energy. Marijuana you can grow in anywhere. You can grow in your backyard, you know, uh, in, a, in a, it's a, a weed, grows everywhere. Uh, on the other hand, tobacco is an industrial crop. You can make money on it. Uh, a lot of inputs, uh, you know, takes a lot of capital and so on. Uh, now, you know, if you have something legal that everybody can do, you're not going to make any profit on it, so you better make it illegal. On the other hand, if there's something that people can make a lot of profit on, especially, uh, you know, agribusness and pesticide and fertilizer companies and so on, it better be legal so you can get away with it. That's just a speculation. I've never seen a study on the topic. Uh, but uh, you might want to look into it. Uh, in any event, the, again, if you, don't, if you don't want a job, that's a qualification. <laughs> but the uh, uh, fact is that marijuana was made illegal, though, and it's probably not good for you, but as far as anybody knows, there hasn't been one recorded overdose, I think, in about 60 million users, as far as I'm aware. But uh, uh, marijuana was essentially made illegal, uh, and a very high percentage of the people now in jail uh, are there because that somebody found a marijuana joint in their po pocket, li quite literally. Uh, the, uh, but, and so Colombia, in fact, shifted from producing marijuana, which is now mostly produced here, to uh, uh, producing cocaine, an industrial drug. And that led to a whole network, you know, peasants in Bolivia sending things up to marijuana to be processed and coming through Mexico where one of the thugs who was the brother of the president just got picked up. The president fled to Harvard. He's going to be teaching in the Harvard Business School, I think. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> not that any of this is any surprise. Everybody knew it who was looking at Mexico. It wasn't in the least bit a secret except in respectable circles. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that's a second a second factor. A third question that arises about the drug traffic has to do with its scale. Well, um, there was a study by the OECD, you know, the Organization of the Rich Countries, uh, just a couple of months ago, and it estimated the profits from the international drug traffic at roughly a tr half a trillion dollars a year, of which they say more than half is received by the United States and circulated through its financial system. Well, that suggests a way to deal with the drug problem. You have a look at the place where more than half the profits are being circulated. Uh, you know, like your friendly banker down the street. Uh, co what about Colombia? Well, according to the uh, OECD report, Colombia gets about $6 billion, which is 2 to 3 percent of what remains in the United States. Uh, I'm quoting now. The big business is therefore in this country, the United States. Uh, I'm quoting from a report on this by the Andean Commission of Jurists and the Latin American Association of Human Rights, which was given considerable publicity uh, in, a, in the leading newspaper in the country, except it didn't happen to be this country, it was Mexico. Uh, the major newspaper in Mexico, Excelsior, government newspaper basically, uh, but freer than the New York Times evidently, published the report of uh, the OECD report which describes where the drug business is really going on. I haven't yet seen it around here, but you know, maybe in 20 years. Uh, the, uh, what about the bankers, uh, the people who are handling over half of this half trillion dollars? Well, there actually is a program in the United States which makes that illegal. And indeed, it's occasionally even been implemented. There was something called Operation Greenback uh, that was functioning around early, the early 80s to try to catch uh, people who were uh, uh, bankers who were handling drug money. It's a pretty easy way to do it. Uh, a law was passed requiring that every bank inform the Federal Reserve if it gets deposits of more than $10,000, and you know, with modern computers and stuff, it's pretty easy to monitor the flow of money. Well, it was discovered that a huge sum of money was suddenly coming into uh, Miami banks uh, right after the cocaine racket was beginning to pick up. So the Justice Department went into operation 
But the operation was terminated in 1982 by the man who was drug czar under the Reagan administration, a gentleman named George Bush, uh, who decided this didn't look like a good thing to do, uh, and therefore that operation was ended. Uh, so the, uh, uh, we don't know any more about uh, this uh, half, half trillion dollars that throws through the finance system. Uh, however, there were other places which are, were more easily investigated, like Panama. Uh, in Panama, uh, the U.S., uh, right after the drug war was announced, with, again, with huge fanfare by George Bush, uh, the U.S. invaded Panama because of those Hispanic narco-traffickers coming down here to shoot up our kids and stuff, led by the arch-fiend Noriega. Uh, and what they did was institute in power the narco-traffickers. Uh, the bankers were reinstituted. The uh, attorney general and the treasury, sec uh, the treasury minister, uh, had been directors of the first Inter Americas Bank, uh, which had been closed by Noriega, incidentally, uh, with applause here. He was then our friend uh, because it was implicated in drug trafficking. So they came back in after the invasion as attorney general and treasury minister. President Dar himself and his law firm were up to their necks in it. Uh, Panama is now a major player in drugs, maybe twice as much flowing through as before. Uh, but again, that's not one of the things you're supposed to be paying attention to. Well, that's part of the drug racket, banking. There's another big part of it. Uh, um, drugs, um, high-tech drugs, not marijuana, require chemicals. Uh, and uh, uh, in 1989, in the six months preceding the announcement of the drug war, preceding it, the Colombian police found 1.5 million gam gallons of chemicals uh, with, uh, used for cocaine production, many of them with U.S. corporate logos on them. Well, that's interesting, uh, particularly interesting because the CIA reported that U.S. exports of such chemicals, in their words, far exceed any legal commercial uses, uh, and the uh, Congressional Research Service, its drug unit, uh, concluded that more than 90% of the chemicals used to make these things come from the United States. So that suggests another way to deal with the uh, narco-trafficking problem uh, were anybody serious in fighting a drug war. Uh, well, what about substance abuse more generally? As I mentioned, there's a much more lethal drug than marijuana. In fact, it's much more lethal than cocaine. That's about 100 times as many recorded deaths here. Uh, the former head of the Office of Drug Abuse Policy, uh, Peter, Dr. Peter Bourne, pointed out not long ago that the number of Colombians who die every year from substances produced in the United States, with a subsidy, incidentally, uh, and uh, advertised, far exceeds the number of North Americans who die from cocaine. Uh, in fact, the same is true here, and cocaine isn't subsidized by the government, although the military that we support is involved in producing and distributing it, uh, and uh, uh, it isn't openly advertised, like they don't have big ads all over the place with a, whatever the equivalent of a Marlboro Man is or something like that. Uh, this is a big story in itself. There's no time to go into it, but it makes the whole narco-trafficking uh, matter look pretty minor in comparison. Well, what about President Gaviria, uh, our friend? Uh, as I say, the human rights record got worse, but he did do one thing. He destroyed the, one of the big cartels, the Medellin cartel, uh, and handed its business over to the other cartel, the Cali cartel. Uh, now, there was an interesting report on this by the same peace and justice group a couple of months ago. Uh, they point, I don't know the details of this, so somebody who knows better can check whether this is accurate, but their report his, was the following. They said that these two cartels were quite different in their nature. These are the two big cocaine cartels. One of them, the Medellin cartel, was lower class in origin. Uh, Pablo Escobar, the big shot, was from the low slum somewhere, and most of them were peasants or middle, you know, lower middle class people or workers who sort of made it up through the rackets. Uh, and apparently the Medellin cartel, though very brutal and killing a lot of people and so on and so forth, had a kind of a Robin Hoodish character to it. So in fact, it was pretty popular. There was a lot of popular support for it. They were building sports stadiums and kind of like old-fashioned city bosses in the United States. 
I mean, pretty brutal thugs, but they were kind of nice to people. You know, you came around if your kid was sick and they gave you money and that sort of business, which is one of the reasons they had such popular support. The Kali cartel, and they were wiped out. The Kali cartel is quite different. They're just rich businessmen. Uh, they're the guys who are on Wall Street and, you know, in the chemical corporations and all into the, you know, the things that aren't called rackets, namely just mass robbery of people. Uh, and so they were untouched and now they run the whole thing. Uh, and apparently the, the drug war was very carefully crafted to destroy one cartel but to build up the other, which seems to have been the effect. Well, that's the drug war. A uh, final comment that ought to be made about it is that the U.S. has tried to help now and then. So in the 1980s, when the cocaine business was really building up, the government of Colombia did approach the United States for assistance uh, in uh, building a radar station, which they could use to high-tech radar station, which they could use to detect low-flying planes coming in from other parts of the Andes into Colombia, uh, and therefore stop uh, drug the drug war, and the Reagan administration was very enthusiastic about this idea, and they did, in fact, construct for them a, a radar station. It was uh, on San Andres Island, which is about, which as, as far as you can get in Colombian territory from the place where the planes were flying, but happens to be off the shore of Nicaragua, and therefore could be used as part of the U.S. terrorist war against Nicaragua. So we did help them out uh, with a radar station. Uh, in the same years, Costa Rica approached us also with the same uh, request, and the U.S. offered uh, help to them too. Costa Rica, however, turned to British experts for advice and analysis, and the British informed them that the station that the U.S. was planning to build would have been totally useless for any drug purpose, but would have been able to be part of the, uh, uh, the uh, aerial surveillance over Nicaragua, which was used to guide the U.S. trained terrorists to attack soft targets there, like health clinics and so on, and so Costa Rica didn't go around with it. So we do help out sometimes. Well, as far as the drug war, these are sort of small facts about the drug war worth, worth bearing in mind. Uh, as for the drug war itself, it has a number of purposes. For one thing, it is a straight cover for counterinsurgency and for simply maintaining the oppressive uh, the oppression under democracy, the Latin American Bureau in Britain uh, described the, uh, Colombia once as a democracy without people, which is pretty much accurate. So in part, it's, uh, the, it's the drug war is a cover for all of that. Uh, for another thing, it's a cover for our arms production addiction, which is a really serious one. Uh, it also has the useful advantage of providing a means to lock up the superfluous population at home. Uh, and that's important because there's a major war going on against the general population here and the big effort being made to try to turn the United States into a third world country. Uh, and that means with a big superfluous population that there's nothing to do with, we don't yet carry out social cleansing by the security forces, so you've got to have other things. And one of the things you do is lock them up and drugs are primarily used for that purpose. Most of the people in jail are for victimless crimes, uh, uh, and the crimes are carefully crafted. So, for example, very carefully crafted, if you look, take, say, cocaine. Uh, the drug of choice in the ghettos happens to be crack. The drug of choice in the rich white suburbs happens to be powder. Pa possession of powder is a misdemeanor. Nothing happens to you. Possession of crack, you know, you probably get the death penalty for it. Uh, well, that's uh, typical class-based legislation, and it explains a good part of what the drug war is about, and it also explains why the prison rate is zooming beyond any other country in the world and expected to go up. Uh, thirdly, the drug war is very useful for frightening the population. Uh, people have to be kept from seeing what's happening to them, and there are classic ways of doing this. One way is to get them to be frightened of one another. Uh, and the drug war, it's another thing we learned from the Nazis and plenty of others, uh, and the drug war does play that role. I don't know how much it affects the general population because it's hard to test, but you can more easily test how it affects the intellectuals, and there it's extremely effective. So if you want to have an example, you can take a look, uh, a look at the latest issue of the uh, Harvard magazine. That's the fancy magazine that goes around to alumni. 
uh, and it has a cover story on some guy who's developed some new leadership techniques, which are now considered really hot stuff. They're teaching them in the business school and so on. Uh, and he gives an example of his leadership techniques and how much they improve things. And the best main example that he gives uh, is George Bush's uh, calling the drug war, which he says uh, Bush made a mistake. He didn't follow his methods. He followed old methods. And the way he describes it is like this. He says when Bush came into office, there was a huge fear and concern about drugs all over the country. Uh, and Bush reacted by calling the drug war uh, and going after Noriega to try to stop the drugs. And that didn't work uh, because he didn't follow the right leadership techniques. Uh, the only problem with the whole story is the fact uh, when Bush came into office, there was virtually no concern about drugs. In fact, a couple of weeks before the drug war was announced, concern over drugs was one of the lowest things on all the polls. I mean, a lot of concern about the budget and jobs and stuff, but drugs were virtually undetectable. Uh, when Bush announced the drug war and the media went into operation, uh, that created the fear about drugs. That's testable. Uh, the polls show it. Uh, there was a huge media campaign. I actually did a, a review just out of curiosity for the month of September after it was announced. I reviewed the AP wires for a month. And uh, stories on drugs out, were outnumbered stories on all foreign affairs combined. You know, everything. Uh, it was like half the stories of everything was drugs. It was all over television and so on. And it had its effect. People got scared of drugs. Uh, so in fact, uh, the propaganda worked and drugs became a big concern, but a manufactured concern, a concern by the doctrinal system. And at least uh, among intellectuals, the right message was established, namely the one that's the opposite of the easily determined facts, uh, which is not an untypical feature of the in intellectual culture, I should say. Uh, finally, last comment, and I'll, just a word, there, the sources of uh, Colombia's tragedy, and it is a tragedy, are not completely external, though for us it's the external causes that are most important. They're internal as well. Uh, this century opened with a civil war in Colombia in which an estimated 100,000 people or so were killed. Uh, there was a populist leader in, uh, killed in 1948, replaced shortly after by the first uh, formal fascist to take power after the Second World War, a supporter of Franco, who we supported. Uh, but after Gaetan's murder in 48, there was a huge upsurge of violence in which hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Uh, the US role begins really primarily with the Kennedy administration and since, and it has been highly significant and remains so. And there also are links to our own society, and they're worth thinking about too, uh, better than I can express them. They were expressed to me in a letter uh, that I got a couple of days ago from a leading activist, a Colombian activist, a woman who was mentioned earlier, Cecilia Zarate Laon. Uh, she, and I'll just quote from her letter, uh, she's discussing uh, a recent meeting of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, one of the few groups in the world that actually does something about poor people and suffering people and people in trouble and so on, and it has an American uh, branch. Uh, they just proposed, came out with uh, what they call the Women's Peace and Justice Treaty of the Americas, which is a very good document in my opinion and worth reading. I don't expect to see a front page article about it soon, but you can get hold of it. Uh, and she points out that, uh, I'll just quote, I firmly believe that everything is interrelated since the real culprit is the economic system and it is very important that the American people start connecting issues abroad with their own reality, starting with its foreign policy, since things do not happen in a vacuum. I will use an example to make my point, the drug issue. The children of poor women who in Colombia have no opportunities because the society has abandoned them and are forced to be hit men or to work in the cocaine laboratories to make cocaine or that are recruited to be members of a death squad team they are in the same situation as the children of poor women in the United States who are forced to sell cocaine on the corners of the streets or to be lookouts for the salesmen and so on, and for the same reasons. The only difference is that the ones speak Spanish and the others speak English. The tragedy is the same. I think she's quite right, and the tragedy is being heightened in both countries by quite 
self-conscious social policy. This is going on while we watch and while so far we do nothing. Uh, and if we choose to do nothing, it's not hard to imagine the prospects. Thanks. Well, perhaps I could begin with, uh, have a, a comment in the question. Uh, first of all, my comment is there are some people who are doing something uh, about the School of the Americas, which is a major training center at Fort Benning, Georgia, for officers, uh, military people in Latin America. And, um, Beginning on this coming March 24th, there's going to be a fast, the beginning of a seven-day fast and lobby to close the School of the Americas, which has been renamed the School of Assassins, uh, by the people who are organizing this campaign. March 24th, the beginning of this fast and lobby, is the 15th anniversary of the murder of Archbishop Romero in El Salvador by uh, graduates of the School of the Americas. And in case people are wondering what is, is it all relevant to Colombia, in the uh, most recent newsletter from the people who are putting together this campaign, it mentions that in Colombia, over 100 of the 246 officers cited for war crimes by an international human rights tribunal in 1993 uh, were graduates of the School of the Americas. Uh, our own Congressman Joe Kennedy has introduced legislation to close the School of the Americas and it has won some support that the, I believe the past two years is, uh, it's been introduced and there's growing support for this and I just want to uh, let people know that this is, this is happening uh, beginning March 24th. I'll put the uh, address and the telephone number for anyone who's interested up on the blackboard. Um, my question is specifically about my understanding is that the organ the groups the guerrilla organizations in opposition uh, in in Colombia uh, merged into an above ground uh, quote unquote legitimate political party called the Patriotic Union, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that was the party that Noam was referring to when he said several thousand members of this uh, now supposedly legitimate political party have been murdered in the past couple of years. I wonder if you could talk about, either of you both of you could, could speak about uh, this, what has happened with the, the guerrilla movement coming together, coming out into the open, and now being uh, subject to a campaign of, uh, of assassination. Okay, uh, first of all, the Union Patriotica, it is true that a lot of the members were people that came out uh, after the deals and the negotiations with the government to become a political party. But it's also true that a lot of the members weren't. Uh, they were just people who weren't school teachers, I mean university teachers or union leaders or community leaders. Uh, what I've seen is that definitely the guerrilla members of the different guerrilla groups came out of uh, ideology, ideology background on the 1940s after Gaetan was killed in 1948 on April 9th, uh, and it was the true from the most of the guerrilla groups at that time. What I've seen in the last 10 years is that they have no any more political ground. They have no more ideological ground in their work. Uh, most of them have become just uh, criminals, common criminals doing a lot of crimes even against the, the community. Uh, we've seen a lot of kidnappings just uh, for any political reason, but just for getting money. I mean, it's different if you see, like, the, when they did uh, get into the embassy of Dominican Republic in the 1980s, and there were all these ambassadors. That was definitely a political move. But then you have seen a lot of crimes, like the one that I told in La Chinita, in Apartado, we have nothing to do with political uh, issues, and that sometimes they repeating the same thing of non-tolerance, uh, against the other group, and yet you see the civilians who are caught up in the middle of this war. Build the uh, beginning of the 
against the third party for the labor movement in this country. And I wanted to uh, find out some more from you about um, what the state is of the labor movement and the unions in Colombia, how people can make connections with that. And I'd also uh, like to hear from Professor Chomsky in terms of what you think his prospects are for this show, such a project in any good way. Well, in Colombia, with these uh, public court order, uh, public court judges and non faith judges and uh, secret evidence, we've seen a lot of, of people that it's very easy because all these trials to accuse somebody of being terrorist or being narco trafficker. So we've seen a lot of union leaders who are being accused of being terrorists and put in jail without being really able to defend themselves because this all this secret evidence. Just uh, an example that was in a strike into the communication system. The union went to a strike and they got out of the country without a uh, telephone for a few weeks. And just uh, a few months after the strike, a lot of the leaders from that strike were put in jail, accused of being terrorists. And as I say, without uh, being any possibility of defense themselves. Uh, these, all these courts, uh, non-faced non judges and all that, is being used more often and often to persecute our uh, political for uh, uh, just political people, people who try to, to become a third party or people who wants to be in opposition. When they can't do that through trials, they do just kill them as they did with the Union Patriotica. Um, well, it, let me begin by a comment about Colombia. I, I said, and this is really wrong, that there were two parties in Colombia and then there was one independent party. Actually, there's one party in Colombia which one of the ex-presidents called uh, two horses with the same owner. Uh, and the Patriotic Union Party was the first party in Colombia. And I think the same can be said here. There's one party. There aren't two parties. Uh, and it's about time we had a second party. Uh, now, there are several initiatives that I think are important and hopeful. One is Labor Party advocates. Another is New Party. I assume they'll get together sooner or later. They have pretty similar program, sort of somewhat different, you know, kind of popular base. Uh, and the comments that I ended from quoting Cecilia are appropriate in spades here. I mean, the labor movement has always had what it called internationals, but they were never international. Uh, it was hard enough to organize nationally. Uh, that's not easy. Capital is tyranny. What, what's called business is just totalitarian tyranny of the most extreme form that humans have ever invented, and it has highly concentrated power. Uh, ordinary people don't have that. They've got to pool their limited resources to get into the game. Now, that's why unions are so hated, uh, because they're a democratizing force. They help ordinary people get together to get into the game altogether, so they have to be destroyed, therefore. Uh, the uh, Labor Party Advocates is an attempt to develop a second party which would be based in par on working people. Working people means almost everybody, remember. Uh, the, uh, 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 and that's a really important initiative, and it has got to be an international. I mean, there is just no way in an in a increasingly globalized economy for working people to defend themselves at a national level. Uh, we see that all over the place. The whole point of things like NAFTA and GATT, one of their major, they're not free trade agreements. These are investor rights agreements designed to place even more power into the hands of private tyrannies. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 you can see it all the time. Right now there's, a big, there's big strikes going on in Decatur, Illinois, very important strikes. They may destroy the American labor movement. Uh, the Caterpillar Corporation and a couple others are trying to destroy the main functioning unions, UAW mainly. I think there'll be some meetings about that around here pretty soon. Uh, well, how can Caterpillar Corp and Decatur, Illinois, which is a working class town, is mostly on strike. How can Caterpillar hope to win? Well, pretty easy, they tell you. Uh, they have built up enough excess production. Remember, product, uh, investment is not primarily for profit, it's for power. Uh, and so there's plenty of excess production developed in order to be able to use as a weapon of class warfare. So they've built up excess production in other countries, like, say, Brazil, uh, and they can produce from those countries uh, to try to undercut working people here in case they go on strike. And they say so. So the Gillette Corporation, for example, which happens to be based around here, 
uh, recently told the business press, told the business press, that they are building up excess capacity, uh, even in countries with much higher wages and better conditions, like Germany. They're building up excess capacity in Germany, so in case workers in Boston get the funny idea of going on strike, they can supply the European and, in fact, the American market from excess productive capacity that they've developed in Germany. Now, you know, unless people across borders can begin to work together the way private tyranny does, they're not going to be able to fight this class war. And it's a vicious class war. There's no doubt about it. So that's going to require political organizations and other kinds of organizations. Uh, and it's not going to come out of the existing single party. Uh, so it's unless that party is radically changed by the existence of alternatives which force it to change. So I think this is a really important initiative. Okay, I'd like to um, thank you all for coming. Did you want to make a quick question? Okay. <laughs> no, is it true that there's a U.S. law that prevents the United States from providing aid to countries engaged in human rights abuses? Oh, oh, yeah. There's, uh, yeah, all of you, yeah. Go ahead. Pardon? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, first, yes, there are laws on the books uh, which make it illegal to provide aid to uh, countries involved in systematic human rights abuses. Uh, this human rights policy is an extremely interesting one, and indeed it shows what young people can do. Uh, this is called the Carter Human Rights Policy, which is a total fraud. Uh, it was a more accurate statement would be that it's a congressional human rights policy, which was rammed down the throats of every executive, including Carter, who had a horrendous human rights policy himself. It was rammed down their throats. They were dragged kicking and screaming to force occasionally to follow it. That includes Clinton uh, by congressional legislation. And if you look back at the congressional legislation, that comes right out of the movements of the 60s, popular move, the, which were mostly youth, young people. A, number of those, a lot of those young people, including some of them who are by now quite high up in the human rights groups and working very effectively when you met in Washington, uh, got into one of the ways in which they decided to change things was to get into Congress and become legislative assistants. It's sort of an open secret that the only people who think in Congress are the young legislative assistants, mostly women. Uh, and they do the thinking and the research and do things, and then the congressmen talk. Uh, and uh, the, like, it's just like anchormen in the newsroom and that sort of thing. The, uh, uh, or a lot of scientific papers, if you look. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, they pushed through legislation, which finally made it through people like Tom Harkins and others, and it got into law, and it is law. Uh, it is a p against U.S. law for... Uh, to provide assistance to any country that systematically tortures its citizens. Uh, Human Rights Watch uh, uh, regularly, when it describes torture, uh, adds a section saying the aid to this country is illegal under U.S. law. The most recent one that they mentioned is the one that gets most of the aid, Israel, which they just put out a report describing what is not a big secret, that Israel systematically tortures people. Uh, and, uh, and pointed out, yeah, all U.S. aid to Israel is illegal. Uh, in fact, just about all U.S. aid is illegal, uh, which means everybody who's putting through that aid should be in jail. Uh, that's, uh, because that's a criminal act to, for, a, for, an, for a person in an executive position in the United States to carry out criminal acts. Uh, so it's all illegal. If the law meant anything, they'd all be in jail. Uh, so that's the answer to the first question. Uh, as for the, uh, incidentally, the same is true of this Omnibus Terrorism Act that's just being discussed now. If it becomes illegal, if, if they pass it, as they will, which makes it illegal to provide aid to any foreign entity uh, which is involved in terrorist activity, everyone in the U.S. Uh, in the White House is going right to jail, or would if there were any laws. Uh, because most of the aid that they provide goes to the Middle East country, which happens to be more engaged in terrorism than anybody else involved. Uh, it's the only country that carries out systematic bombing of defenseless civilian targets, rocketing, kidnapping, uh, just recently blockaded uh, the coast of Lebanon for a month to prevent fishermen from going out. 
Uh, that's terrorism, in fact, international terrorism, and they do it because we give them the money and the support for it and pay the costs and so on. So anybody who gives aid to the Jewish National Fund or, in fact, pays their taxes uh, is instantly uh, guilty under the Omnibus Terrorism Act. But again, though this is transparently obvious, you're going to wait a long time before you read it. Uh, the, uh, we have a disciplined intellectual class who don't see things. You know, you have to be taught very hard in many years in places like Harvard and MIT so you don't see what's before your eyes. Uh, the, uh, uh, so yeah, it's all illegal, flatly illegal. Uh, furthermore, the most terrorism and, uh, uh, like I said, it's Washington that's the torture capital of the world if you trace it back. Uh, well, what about Jennifer Harbury? Jennifer Harbury is another personal friend. There's a woman who uh, is now on, on a hunger strike again. This is the second long hunger strike. Her husband uh, was a, uh, she's an American lawyer, in fact, whose husband was a Mayan uh, guerrilla in uh, Guatemala who was captured by the Guatemalan military, which is maybe the most brutal in the hemisphere. Apparently, Colombia has just surpassed them and taken first prize, but I don't know exactly who really wins. I might mention, incidentally, that the leading killer in Guatemala, uh, uh, General Gramajo, who was responsible for not just things like the Trujillo massacre, but for killing tens of thousands of people in the highlands, uh, he was shipped off to Harvard two or three years ago to improve his skills uh, because the State Department was planning to have him be their next president. He was their kind of like white-haired boy or whatever you call it. Uh, the uh, local activists around here, here's some other things you can do, discovered that he was here. Uh, Harvard denied it, but it was true. Uh, and uh, Alan Nairn, who's the person who, a very good freelance journalist, who was the guy who exposed the source of the death squads back in the Kennedy planning, in fact. Uh, Alan Nairn, working with the Center for Constitutional Rights, Alan has quite a flair, uh, managed to uh, serve General Gramajo with a subpoena uh, at the moment of the Harvard graduation, while all the television cameras were focused on him and he was just getting his diploma, Alan ran up there with a subpoena prepared by the Center for Constitutional Rights, accusing him of human rights violations. There is a US law which makes it possible to sue foreign, foreigners resident here for atrocities carried out in the home country. Uh, he, of course, fled the country right away. Uh, and the case was settled, he was sentenced in absentia to $10 million. Same thing was repeated the next year for an Indonesian general. Uh, so there are plenty of things you can do to make the country less hospital to, to, hospitable to mass murders and killers, uh, though unfortunately the ones in Washington remain immune for the moment. Uh, Jennifer Harbury is on strike. Uh, her husband was captured, uh, allegedly, killed, so the Guatemalan military claim, but she by now has plenty of evidence from people who were in jail with him that he wasn't killed, he's being tortured, held and tortured somewhere. Uh, and she's been on fasting a, a couple of weeks ago, she had a month long fast in Guatemala City, which takes a lot of guts, I should say, uh, to uh, protest this. And uh, there was some move on the part of the State Department and, some, and the Guatemalan government saying they were going to do something about it. But of course, they didn't. So she started her fast up again. And with enough support, and it's always the same question. If there's enough popular support, there may be an effect, not just for her husband, but uh, for plenty of others who were in a similar situation. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you all you stayed. And uh, thank our two speakers, Juan Pablo Ordonez and Noam Chomsky. Thanks a lot.